as soon as I had those last two things, I put a three week notice in offering to train whoever. They let me go that day and I was mobile welding that night and I never looked back. Wow. So my wife told me, she's like, if you can make at least $400 a week, you can quit your job. I'm like, I can buy and sell <laughs> long enough to make $400 a week. I'm out, right? You can make a mountain of metal. Today's episode is brought to you by the FMA Annual Meeting. The industry's largest networking event heads to Las Vegas February 28th through March 2nd. It's your opportunity to connect with executives and leaders in metal fabrication, steel production and distribution, service centers, and so much more. Hear from experts on trending industry topics and the insights you need to drive decisions. And remember, what happens in Vegas takes your business further. Register today for the 2023 FMA Annual Meeting at fmamfg.org. What was that again? That's fmamfg.org. Hello, everyone. Uh, Dan Davis, Editor-in-Chief of The Fabricator Magazine, joined by my friend, <laughs> Jim Gorzik. I'm Jim Gorzik friend director of sales for the fabricator uh we are here to introduce today's episode with michael brant of uh garage bound in chattanooga tennessee we had a good chat with him yeah uh but as we're talking about tennessee we're kind of rehashing some news that in and out burgers locating an office right actually in tennessee i think it's more nashville but mm -hmm. god is thinking about burgers and mm -hmm. it's hard not to think about burgers yeah yeah and apparently jim you're a big fan of the in and out you know yeah you know and i it's a, it's a good burger it's a good burger i it's not my favorite but i think it is very very good what's Did the you, grease level on, it? on the uh greaseometer yeah uh it's probably from one to ten I'd say it's it's on the lower end okay right it's like what, a four uh, or five maybe? what did you order did you know the secret language Oh, I'd heard about that. You know, I've I've had I think I've had it three times. I uh, was aware of the secret language the last time I ordered, but I did not. I just went. Isn't it dirty? Is that the I know, was that animal style? Animal style. Yeah, animal that's style it. means. I mean, is that like that? Just sounds like raw. It's brutal. They punch it. Animal rares. style means a chicken patty on a hamburger on with top bacon, of baked fish, <laughs> <laughs> baked fish. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's where you get to do your own slaughter process in the back and just yeah. uh -oh. cut off a slab. Keeping it real, they call it. Yeah. 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 So in and out. I've never had it. In it you've never had I've it? I've never had it. I think I've had it once and it was not memorable. Really? I, uh, yeah, I'm not like huh. I'm not a big fan of like a, a fast, casual twenty dollar burger fry drink combo. I don't think it was that expensive. I know, but it's like a whole thing. So what's yours? What's your go-to? I, I think if I'm in a mood for a burger, I'm going Culver's. Yeah, that's very yeah. Midwestern. And, that, and believe me, I'm giving them some wiggle room with those crinkle cut fries because I think that's really a shortcut. Yeah. But you know what? They're pretty good. Yeah. So you like the fresh, never frozen, right? That's their approach. Yeah, just it's a simple burger. And I think a yeah. burger is not a yeah. complicated thing. And Jim, the issue yeah. becomes... If it's too much, man, the idea that I'm holding a sandwich that is actually releasing liquid onto me, that is absolutely <laughs> disgusting. I don't want that. So you, you you don't like a high number on the greaseometer? Dude, I've been, like I've been known to start eating some type of sandwich at a knife and fork. Like open-faced oh. meatball sandwich, it's impossible to eat with your yeah. hands. You like a burger? If I've got to attack a burger with a, a fork and knife, I don't want to eat a piece of it's that. It's not a no. burger at that point. It's, it's not a burger. A it's a meal. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm surprised yeah. you're yeah, not a Culver's guy, Jim. You're from Oh, Wisconsin. no, I am. I, you know what? I Culver's great, great burger. Love it. It's probably I like it better than In-N-Out for sure. That, that sounds like a yeah. trick from like some kind of dirty de like uh, a defense attorney or something double like Double reverse. <laughs> the Jackie butter. Child. So, for you. <laughs> Tell us why you don't hit your Culver's burgers anymore, Jim. Well, how about this? Oh, so you, <laughs> Edit. <laughs> so, <laughs> Culver's gives you the choice of... Fries, your crinkle cut, or curds. What do you? So yeah, I didn't what are your, your? So, so that is almost. I I feel bad for not making that point. That is very valid. Yeah. I I get so normally my curds run is like on the way to the grocery store just to give me something to tie it over to eat <laughs> on the five Scooby mile drive. Snacks. Yeah, exactly. Danny snacks. If there's yeah. ever curds on the menu, you always order curds. 
Yeah, you got to really? try them. Yeah, you yeah. Try so them. do you automatically get the side of marinara? Uh, no, I. What? Oh. If you can't eat a curd plain, then it's not a good. I think curd. I'm in agreement right. with you. I think marinara just throws it off for me. Oh yeah, I mean, it's not a only, mozzarella uh, stick. Yeah, yeah, it's only with the sticks. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know. Uh, you guys, five guys. I I place that to that too complicated, really? too expensive, and too comp. I don't need all that. It's been that's, a while. That's my jam. That's my. Really? That's yours. Yeah. Really. I like that you have to go. There's no drive through. You have to go in, and they throw everything in a brown bag. And you can see the grease come through the brown bag. And let's, they, they don't even really put the fries in like a yeah, pouch. Look, they I'm just not throw saying, it in the bag. I'm not saying yeah. it's not good. It's just yeah. not my It's not my. Thing. I hear you. It's like too yeah. much. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know. I, In all honesty, if I'm usually going to fast food, I'm usually doing like a chicken sandwich. Yeah. Well, Which that's kind of the been purpose, the, the jam lately, this old right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like Popeye's <laughs> kind of set the bar on like the yes. new. So not even. So that's another thing. Like, look, if I'm at Popeye's, I'm going chicken, man. I'm not doing mm-hmm. a sandwich. Oh, sure. Oh, oh you don't get the going, yeah. you don't get that Popeye's chicken sandwich. No, no. If you remember the at Popeye's, you're defeating the purpose of being a Popeye's. Was it like two years ago when they yeah, released they, that sandwich? Like they were running out. Yeah. Yeah. Right long, after they opened. Long, long, yeah. Yes. No, I, yeah. I think I, I think most of your fast food places do a decent chicken sandwich that's all i need to tide me over yeah and frankly the, i you know i still got a, a little thing for mcdonald's i keep it on the side away from my family but <laughs> <laughs> but I, I i love the fries dan has <laughs> never eaten like recently has never eaten mcdonald's outside of his car <laughs> Right. It's that is actually like, an accurate right. statement. That is actually an accurate statement. Buddy, I'm going to go wash the car. Well, yeah. why do you have mayo when you come back? So mayo. Really, really, the, I, had the app, mayo? I literally yeah. had the app so I could take advantage of the breakfast sandwich because I'm usually uh, I'm usually Jones for the biscuit on a Sunday mm-hmm. in our uh, Chick Fil A. Obviously, yep. you know uh, Sky Point, but you know they're not open on uh, Sunday, so I could go to and McDonald's has an awfully it's a decent substitute. Sure, and frankly, mm-hmm. Chick Fil A went away from there. Uh, fried chicken patty on their uh, spicy chicken biscuit to two strips, which is a little complicated because wow. you know you don't mm. want anything falling out. Yeah, then you, you, yeah, what do you do? Take a again, bite and then you. I need things to be self-contained. I don't want to be things falling out on me. Yeah, particularly yeah. as I drive while I eat. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Driving. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, that's why some burgers they come with like the the, the, the wrap. half wrap. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that wraps on there for a reason because right. obviously something it's all like, going to fall off the end. It's yeah. going to drop. That's yeah. quite the uh, yeah. not happy thing when that happens as you're pulling up at an intersection, not watching the light, and have to jam on the brakes because <laughs> yeah, you because pickle just dropped in your, your cr- crotchular area. Yeah, <laughs> you know it would be interesting. You know, a Michael Brandt episode coming up. Right, he dropping. did that flame tech chair. Yeah, that you can see on the screen if you're watching, but uh, it shot flames right off the yeah, top. Of right the, out. This, torch chair that looks like something out of game of thrones right yeah yeah, yeah. what I, I wonder is does he eat messy foods on top of the chair no i, th- I think he, he cooks it off the top of that chair oh he just yeah i yeah. think you want to avoid that to keep like your uh your your consumables clean yeah. do you yeah. guys remember seeing the chair at fabtech 2019 at all yes yeah, I remember, yeah. it was very popular yes, yes. did well, you sit in it and have a picture taken i didn't I, I went up to it and i talked to him a little bit about it the the project that he worked on with flame tech and he said that it, they were trying to get it involved with a mad, like a future Mad Max movie oh. production. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how. I don't. I don't think that ever played out. But we'll find out if there's ever new Mad Max movies. No, I think they're they're in the works. Yeah, I yeah. forget who got the uh, cast ahead of uh, what's her name? Angelina Jolie. No. Oh. Uh, the, uh, Charlize Theron. Yeah. Yes. Charlize. Yeah. Yeah. You have to say it like that too. Char- Theron. Charlize Theron. Whatever she wants. <laughs> <laughs> so All right, well, that's, she may that's... sit there upon. Her All right, throne. let's wrap this up. All right. All right. Let's go talk to Michael Brandt. Yeah. <laughs> let's go get a burger. Yeah. yeah, right. We'll be right back. I'm hungry. The Fabricator Podcast is presented by Nuts, Bolts, and Thingamajigs. As the foundation of the Fabricators and Manufacturers Association, NBT is helping the next generation discover their future across the country in manufacturing through hands-on camps and scholarship programs. You can invest in tomorrow's workforce by visiting nutsandboltsfoundation.org. One more time, nutsandboltsfoundation.org. All right, I'll do the intro. What is it? I feel comfortable doing an intro. Can you do it Prestige Worldwide style? Prestige Worldwide presents the Fabricator Podcast with Fabricator Dan Davis. Fabricator Podcast. With Jim Gorzik.
Jim Gorzik. On the computer. On Garrett the computer. Gareth Slager. And our friend Kyle with the headphones. <laughs> and our guest today, Michael Brandt. Yes. Of Garage Bound. Garage Bound LLC in Chattanooga. Chattanooga. <laughs> Michael, you're no stranger to Fabtech. No, sir. And that's where we are today, taping this, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, you were kind of talking about it was nice to be here as almost with l fewer commitments. Yeah. The ability to kind of take it in as actual fabricator. Yeah, so uh, Fabtech's of the past where we, we'd be booked in multiple booths on a time schedule, you know. Is very good to give you know homage and thank you back to the partners that we've partnered with, and yeah. then to invite those people to the booth to see what we've done or what what we've done with their product right. is good. But it's also good to be more of an attendee with less responsibilities, so that I can go and visit them on a more personal note, you know, yeah. and and uh, visit you know even new companies that I have interest in, you right. know, per yeah. perhaps using their products or you know stuff like that. Yeah. It's good for uh, fabricators having the chance to be a fabricator yeah. <laughs> and actually <laughs> enjoy the, the place. Instead well, of and enjoying being, the fellows around yeah. me, you know, because like... Kind of a celebration of your craft almost. Right, yeah, because there's a lot of people I still look up to, yeah. you know, that I want to take time to visit with that if you're nice. all booked up doing those obligations that you may not have otherwise had time. Yeah. Sure. Is there anything you're looking for at the show? It's more of the attendee, we'll call you. Well, I, I already spent a grand on the tools I was trying to get from Fireball Tool. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, where's Fireball? Where's Fireball? I finally found them. They had a new tool that uh, they released this year, and it's just so amazing. And we build a lot of square and rectangle things for yeah. like oh, okay. the new build out of restaurants. It's a neat and little story. It's yeah, a good company. These tools are uh, going to be perfect for what we use them. Yeah. Nice. What we use, what we so do. So give us uh, a little bit about your background. Yeah. Uh, how you got started with fabricating and how you ended yeah. up with garage bound. So I got started in fabricating, not through welding. <laughs> it was through like custom card building. Okay. Like yeah. greeting cards. So a lot yeah. of fabrication went into those. So I learned a lot about, you know, measuring and planning and, and like the mechanics because I made these pop-up greeting cards. Oh, wow. And then uh, I was able to, once I figured out that I couldn't really make a career out of that unless I could afford a laser cutting machine to cut all the parts out for yeah. me. I'm like, oh, you know, what came up at that time was like, oh, I want to build a couple of these rat rod bicycles for my son and I, right? right. So nice. I looked on, at, the, at that time it was Craigslist and any kind of cheap welding machine I could afford, I was collecting trying to get to learn how to use. and. They were all garbage. They were all garbage until yeah. right, right. a friend that went to sculptor school in college says, hey, I have a Miller 185 in my warehouse I never use anymore. You know, you're welcome to buy it from me. And when I bought that machine, I could actually start making good looking welds consistently. <laughs> wow. Okay. And so that's what hooked me on Miller, you know. Yeah. Ah, but okay. my welding and fabrication started with the, the want and desire to make a couple rat rod bicycles yeah. for my son and I. That's cool. And then... Once I did that, I was just like, oh, I need to learn how to weld aluminum. I'm like, I guess I better find a machine that it can do it, right? Yeah. So I looked and looked and looked for months on, again, on Craigslist, and I saw an advertisement that said manufacturing equipment for sale, and that's all it said. Right. So I emailed them. I'm like, do you have any welders that would weld aluminum, a TIG welder? Right. And then they sent me back uh, a picture of this Sinker Wave 250, this giant boat anchor, <laughs> right? And they're like, we have this. I'm like, cool, how much is it? She's like, well, what's your offer? <laughs> and I um, said like 700 bucks. Oh, sorry, we already have an $800 offer. Oh. And I said, well, if I offer you 900, are you going to tell the next guy he has to pay 10? <laughs> no, if you offer us 900, you can have it. Oh, wow. So I'm like, I offer you 900. And I didn't have $900, uh -huh. but I had a giant toolbox in my garage that I knew I could sell to get at least most of it. And so I sold this giant toolbox and I got some wow. money for Christmas from my wife and I drove four and a half hours to go get this welding machine. Wow. Brought nice. it back, brought it back to my two car garage and set it up. And I'm like, shit, now I got to figure out how to use this. It's got more dials and buttons. <laughs> I didn't even know how barely to turn it on. Right. So I had a friend that used to be a TIG welder and he came over and gave me one hour's worth of instruction on aluminum. And I practiced every night and every weekend. And the first month I had that welding machine, I jacked my electricity bill up to $350. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, welding aluminum is expensive, right? I, I need to learn how to make money doing this now to pay for the electric bill. I needed to sell a wrench or two to pay for <laughs> Where did you get all the material from? Oh, so I, at that time I worked in the forklift industry. I was oh, a forklift okay. technician. 
Okay. And so I'd go out and fix forklifts everywhere in metal fabrication areas. Right. And I'd beg for scrap pieces. Okay. And you'd be surprised wow. what they would give you. I'd have <laughs> a van full of tools and another van full of scrap material. Right, right. Which is funny because, like, when we moved from my house, when my wife and I moved into one home together, she would always, I had a whole tr parking spot and it was my metal mountain. But it's like, you don't understand. I can take a small piece of metal like this and make 75 bucks with it, you know? Yeah. But she made me get rid of it. I hauled 11,000 pounds of scrap iron Ooh. from my house <laughs> when we moved. <laughs> <laughs> metal how do you mountain. Make, how do you make that move? Many times oh, is probably car the trailers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At that time, I had car trailers. Oh, it's so funny. I got a boat trailer that um, I didn't have a boat. I'm like, oh, let's make it into a flatbed trailer. So I... That was one of my first welding projects is making a frame out of this boat wow. trailer and so completely self-taught as a fabricator well i can't say completely self-taught um i had help along the way oh, yeah know? so but a lot like, of trial and error I guess. a lot of trial and error yeah. yeah i could have avoided that if i went to school maybe or worked <laughs> at a fabrication place but i was doing well fixing forklifts yeah. until um in 2011 i was invited to put a bid in uh, on a trellis for rock city and they they only offered it to three local artists and i don't really you know like <laughs> consider myself an artist yeah, right. it's so cliche yeah but anyway i went played along with it yeah and so i went to, on site and drew this big two foot by three foot drawing of these big structures and all this stuff and then like my drawing was way over the top compared to the other people's drawings. Yeah. And the, the man that introduced me, my friend John McLeod introduced me to them because the year before he had won a sculpture installation out of wood. Yeah. And they called him, do you think he could do this? <laughs> He's like, if he says he'll do it, he'll do it. Right. You know? Yeah. And so they called me and I won the bid and my heart sunk. I'm like, oh, now I got to build this thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? I drew it pretty good. You know? yeah. Now I got to build this thing in a two car yeah. garage. And, but yeah. build it, I did. Took 11 months. No kidding. Wow. Every day after work, every weekend, wow. I sacrificed and plugged away until we built these giant pieces that all broke down, you know, and bolted together on site. And later that year, uh, somehow I ended up winning Artist of the Year through oh. Chattanooga and the Chamber of Commerce for that oh, project. Wow. What year was that? 2011. 11, wow, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So then my forklift job came to an end. My sister was married to the general manager and she started a divorce and he made it real clear there was no more favors for you, buddy. <laughs> oh, wow. And so I, st I, took, I took this award and pictures to this fabrication place and say, look, I have this equipment at home. This is what I made with it. I won an award. You know, I'd like to learn more. And they're like, come on. They couldn't get me fast enough. Really? <laughs> so I worked there for three years until... I felt like I, there was nothing, I was going to be another five years until right. I felt I could advance. Right. And I didn't want to wait that long. Yeah. So I um, worked my way up. I think I was making $19 an hour or something. And then an opportunity came at a, a ornamental ironworks place. Okay. Sure. And it was a lateral move. I wasn't making any more money, right. but I was very interested in learning yeah. handrails, spiral staircases and things <laughs> like that. And so when I turned my two-week notice in, they made me work 14 business days, <laughs> offered me more money to stay. Um, oh, wow. And I'm like, it's not about the money. It's about that I can't progress here for the next five years. Oh, right. right. You know, and they understood that. Yeah. Because there's somebody else above me. Right. And he was a solid person, and yeah. right. I wanted his job, but I wasn't going to get it. I wasn't going to push right. him out. Yeah. You know, so I'm like, I'm going to go learn these things. But the way that ended made that company a, a really valuable asset even through today. Really? You know, sure. we left on sure. such good terms. Like when they have a giant job, they'll actually pay me my shop rate to come help them sometimes. No kidding. You know, wow. or if they're retiring a piece of equipment, they'll call me. Hey, Mike, you want this? I'm like, how much? And I got this giant loan slip roll for twelve hundred bucks. And they they <laughs> wow. still sell for like seven, twelve, fifteen thousand wow. dollars. Wow. So it really is a lesson in not burning bridges. Correct. Right, yeah. Don't right. build. Don't burn bridges. Yeah. I know that can be frustrating for a lot of fabricators because the the, the, the wage thing is an issue and people want to yeah. earn more yeah. money. But at the same time, sometimes you have to take your skills elsewhere. Well, you got to get a the the money perhaps, but also the experience. And the more experience, even as a business owner, employees is one of the hardest things I have to do. Yeah. You know, and manage. Right. And like when I was an employee, I, and I felt like I was due for a raise. I would go to my employer and say, that, you know, I'd like to earn more money. You know, what do I need to do, learn, or accomplish, or get to before right. I could reach this financial goal of mine? Right. They'll tell you. Right. And yeah. you work your butt off and you earn it. 
But like what I've noticed as a business owner, you know, some of these guys, well, if you paid me this, I'll do that. Right. Yeah. I'm like, no, yeah, no, that wrong. doesn't work for me. You know, it's like, you know, if you feel like you're ready or you deserve, let me give you something to work toward and you yeah. can earn that, you know, gladly. If you can get here, it's going to help me out there and I'll gladly give you the compensation you're asking yeah. for. Nice. But there's a lack of that same line of thinking that I've experienced through the through the employee pool of people that I choose to get. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. How so, big of a, a shop do you have? How many people? So like um, my second or third, my second year in business, I had six employees. Okay. And it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm always like, go big or go home, right? Yeah. But what that did and what I learned through that process was um, that I had to take every single job that came through, whether it was good paying or not, oh, okay. you know, and it right. really like, there were some weeks I didn't know. And I know payroll of $3,500 is not a lot for a lot of these companies. But to me at that time was a lot of money. Oh, yeah. And it's right. like some, there was some Mondays I didn't know how I was going to make payroll Thursday. Oh, wow. And it right. always worked out. But you know, I got the same question from the bank when I filed for a loan on a piece of property. How come at this time you had, you know, this many employees and you had this much return at the end of the year. Now you were making like twice as much money with like one or two employees. I'm like, well, that's easy. I was dumb. I didn't know what I was doing. You right, know? Yeah. I'm right. doing more with less and choosing which jobs. And that was one of the hardest things for me to do as a small business owner was turn away work. Right. You know, I it's like can imagine, yeah. I had to save that time and that slot open for a better opportunity. So yeah. there's some things I'd be like, you know, I don't feel like this is the best job for me tying me up with this. Yeah. Um, you might check with one of my friendly competitors and yeah. I hand my competitors information out a lot. Yeah. Like, look, you know, if you want me to do it, it's this price. If you think that's not, right. it's too much for you, you know, please, by all means, you should probably get more than one quote. Not too many, <laughs> not too many secrets in the local competition. <laughs> yeah, it works out good. <laughs> yeah. So how did you get involved with GarageBound? What, what road oh, led to that? So the name came from we were I, we were in my in my house and all my shop was in my garage and right at the end there before we moved i had all my equipment around the parameters and i barely had enough room to slide up in the middle and even do a project yeah. and one day i was dressing up like a penguin because it was really cold and my wife's <laughs> like where are you going i'm like i'm garage bound headed to the garage you know <laughs> and so it just kind of stuck i started making I like business it. cars before i even had a business yeah. describing like I remember one of my first business cards had that bicycle on it that I made. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's like light light fabrication, you know, right. and welding aluminum, you know, just the things I felt comfortable doing at right. that time. So I'm on generation four of my business cards now. And it's fun to see like what I had started out with, my right. very yeah. limited skill set that I could do right. versus now is like I don't say light fabrication anymore because yeah. if I have enough room where I can lift it when I'm done, right. I'll build it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So when I started my business and I filed for, you know, my business license, my wife is like, you're going to call it GarageBand? I'm like, I'll call it Purple Dinosaur if I want. It's my business, you know? <laughs> so it, that's what I stayed with. Very Got good. It. Yeah. Got it. Do you have elements of that garage in your shop now? I do, yeah. So, Like, how, how, how do the two compare? Uh, so from my first place to where I am yeah. now? Yeah, yeah. So I had a, a two-car garage versus 7,000 square foot that I have now. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, so it's quite different. I still have my very first aluminum welding coupons that I ever welded with That's that awesome. synchro wave. <laughs> and uh, I wish I had not sold it because that, sh that machine should have gone in my museum. Right, I right, have, right. I yeah. have a museum of antique welders in my, in my office. That's, wow. Yeah. Wow. We so, had a, yeah. a conversation earlier with somebody about that. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah we had uh, uh, Nate Bowman oh, yeah. collects vintage welding. I heard he's got a pretty extensive collection, yeah. too. Well, so. What are some of your favorites? Well... <laughs> I hate to say this, but one of my favorites that means the most to me is um, is a Lincoln buzz box, tombstone buzz box, you know? Gotcha. And it was my grandfather's, and it was Ooh, wow. the first welder I ever welded with when I was eight in his shop. Wow. And uh, my grandfather passed, but my dad saved the welder. Oh, and wow. And then my dad put it on a lawnmower push frame without the motor on it so he could move it around. <laughs> and so Man. now it hangs, you know, from the ceiling in my office on display. That's oh, awesome. Yeah. That's cool. But, um... I have like a 1947 Miller engine drive that's pretty cool that still works. Wow. That's pretty neat. Wow. And then wow. I have a 1967 Healy Arc. It's like giant, right? It's round <laughs> on the top and it has yeah. the crank on the top. Right. And it still works in AC even. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So That's awesome. It's interesting. It sounds like a lot of those old welders that you found are in working order. Say again? 
a lot of the old welders that you found are in working order. Yeah. Or mostly right. working order. Yeah, right. And then I have a little welder. Like in the 1960s, there was a popular mechanics um, magazine. Right. And uh, they showed somebody, or they were showing people how to make your own welder out of a transformer. Yeah. And so somebody donated that to me. And a local fireman, you know, way back in the day, had made this, the transformer's open. It has like a plunger like you blow TNT up oh, with right. in the cartoons <laughs> on the top. I've not tried that one yet. <laughs> it, com it comes with a with a coyote that chases yeah. after a roadrunner. Meep meep. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, what type of work are you doing nowadays with Garage Bound? Uh, I get asked that question a lot, and it's always very broad. It's yeah. Like, you know, when I started business, I wanted to be able to do anything with all metal, and so really, that's what I do. Yeah. And. Um, so one day we'll be fixing a 53 foot semi tanker aluminum for you know how they haul fuel and diesel and stuff right the next day we'll be building custom art work for rock city uh, the next day we'll be cutting a bunch of plates for whoever with whatever size holes for whatever they do with them on our plasma yeah. table right. um, it's really all over the board so. you have to chase work a lot or do I you find word, word of mouth i don't so works out i've well. never advertised no um, it's all been referral Word of mouth and repeat customers. Yeah, like, I don't think there's been one customer that I've upset enough where they don't want to do no work kidding. with me. Yeah, it's just like wow. you know, I know that's where my bread and butter comes from. So when we make a deal, I fulfill my end of the deal. And fortunately, we we very rarely have any failure. And if I do, I stop exactly what I'm doing, and that's my you're not my new priority. Right. You know, so I'll always go that extra mile, even if it takes me more time, labor, mm -hmm. even if it takes me more money and materials. Right. It's like it's not leaving till it's done. How much of your business is in shop? Uh, most of our business is in shop. Uh, the second year I was in business, I outfitted two mobile welding unit trailers, okay. but uh, I ended up disassembling and selling some of that equipment off because. I couldn't keep one mobile welding unit busy enough to justify having two. Oh, so I got I'd you. say like 90% uh, of our business is inside shop, inside shop work. Yeah. Has that, how has your business evolved since it's been open? So it started out as a hobby, right? Yeah. So that's quite different from <laughs> when you are struggling to pay the bills as right, a business owner. Right. Um, it evolves according to what material or what, what my skill set is at yeah. the time or what my machines are at the time yeah. you know i'll like i spent you know a bunch of money with bailey industrial to buy a radius roller for a job that ended up getting put off for over a year no kidding you know, it's like oh man wow. i was gonna spend you know now i gotta work this machine and figure right. out how to make money with it in a different avenue and it worked out really good it was a pretty specialized piece of equipment but none of my local competitors have one. Okay. So, you know, I'm, I try to be friends with everybody that does what I do, thinking yeah. there's enough for everyone. Right. You know, I'll pass sure. you jobs gladly when I don't have time. You know, like customers will call, I'm like, if you can wait after three weeks, yeah. I'll be more than happy on week four to meet with you and discuss your project. Right. right. If you need it before then, please go to one of these guys, you know? Yeah. But in the future, I'd love to have first shot again. I'm, I just can't get to it right now. Yeah. So it's, it's... What were some of the things you did with that Bailey piece of equipment? Oh, so we build all kinds of cool 3D fencing and stuff for Rock City. Okay. We'll build arches. Um, we've built fire pits. Okay. Uh, it's oh, yeah. been a really cool, fun, creative tool. Whatever, That's awesome. Whatever you can dream up and you want to roll a small radius to yeah. a large radius to a perfect circle. We rolled this uh, perfect 16 foot one inch. It had to be 16 foot one inch. <laughs> out, of two inch um, out of two inch stainless light gauge uh, polished pipe oh. wow. <laughs> for the Children's Discovery Museum. But it wouldn't fit through the door, so it had to. <laughs> these sticks were like eleven hundred dollars a piece, so I had to roll two of them to the perfect radius. So right. I I drew the radius in SolidWorks on my computer, and I cut a little pie slice about that big with the handle in it, so I could check it because it's a manual machine. Right. Yeah, you know, half a crank too much, it'll be too tight. The yeah. radius. So. Huh. It was really nerve wracking and it had like, I had a short deadline on it Yeah. and they had to ship it in from Canada, the material or something. Wow. But uh, <laughs> it's a ring that hangs from the ceiling in their cafe that pigs hang off of at the Children's Discovery Museum. And they have these little controllers to make the wings flap oh, and stuff. Yeah. It's a pretty cool project. How'd you get through huh. the door? Yeah. We built it in two pieces and it okay, bolted together. Gotcha. Two pieces, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. why they had to be perfect, you know? Yeah. <laughs> what are some of your most recent projects that stick out like that? Uh, we just installed right before we came here um, 
a, a really cool door for Rock City that covers like a cave entrance. It's got oh, this wow. big curly queue and it comes over and closes that. Mm -hmm. And um, what exactly Rock City? Rock City is a local attraction, uh, kind of like a theme park. In oh, Chattanooga. I got it. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah so right. it's actually in Georgia, Lookout, Lookout Mountain, Georgia. Right, right, right. But that's been a really since I built that uh, trellis for them. Yeah. You know, they every year they come up with something fun and creative. And, oh wow! Oh. And that's really my only venue for being paid to do artwork. Yeah. So it's an important relationship to me. And we've done so much stuff there. Now it's like when I bring friends and people in from out of town, it's like, let's go to my gallery. You know? <laughs> it's not mine, you know, but I'm yeah, still proud yeah. of a lot of the work we've done there. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, we've been mixing most recently. There's a local glass, a hand-blown glass place oh, in really? Chattanooga called Ignis Glass. Wow. So we've been doing all the metal work, and then they're pouring and forming their glass into the metal work that we do. And oh. we got a big chandelier with these cones. I had to build this cone like three inches at the top comes down to a six inch ring and it's got half inch rods and then it comes back down well it had to be like a clamshell so that they could put the glass on the blow stick open okay. the shell put the glass in there close the shell really quick before yeah. the glass starts cooling and blow it and the glass comes up and goes outside of the form oh wow oh, really? it's so cool wow yeah. so like we're getting ready to do 12 different pieces of those for a chandelier at Rock no City. No kidding. Yeah, Whoa, it's going to be pretty epic. I'm seems pretty cool. excited about this project. Yeah, yeah we yeah. just don't see it happening, you know? So no, 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 no. I think one of the coolest things with my customers is they come with problems. Yeah. And right. I get to figure them out. Right. You know, it's like, right. okay, you're going to pay me to take your problem on. Sounds great. You know, there's always a way. Right. You know, and there's always more than one way. It doesn't have to be my way. Just yeah. a way that works in the end. Is it all trial and error trying to work your way through this? Yeah. Or can you rely on some of your network? To kind of help oh, you out. Oh, so I do have a network of people. Yeah. Um, people smarter than me. Yeah, <laughs> I have many different mentors in my life. Yeah. I have business mentors. I have fabrication mentors. I have other welding mentors. You know, Blue Demon is a huge mentor of mine because even though he doesn't weld, he's been in the welding and they've been in the welding industry for so long. Right. Like if I'm welding a type of material I've not done before, I'd be like, hey, this is what I'm welding. Oh, you need this. And then they send it to me and I, yeah. I'm that much more successful. Right. Leaning upon their education and their background and their experience. So nice. I'm very fortunate to have a lot of mentors. That's awesome. Yeah. It's not all me. I'm not the smart one. It's not you. <laughs> I'm just a worker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a question. Uh, okay. What kind of led to you? You seem very loyal with your partnerships. Right. Uh, what kind of led to that kind of mindset? You know, I came about that just through my own experience was with that first Miller welder. It's like, I have a machine here that actually is going to help me be successful. I'm going to swear brand loyalty to that machine and that company, you know, and would continue buying that product whether they're, you know, supporting me or not. Right. So right, like right. getting <laughs> Josh Welton was the one I stared at for a long time, figured Josh out, Walton trying to figure here. out. <laughs> He's sitting over here in the corner. And Josh had what I wanted. Too. I wanted what Josh had with Miller, you know, and it's like if he could do it, I can figure out how to do it. So I just thought, well, maybe I just need to find out who's in charge of the partnerships and go introduce myself right, and try right. to bring something to the table they're not currently promoting. And so that's what I did. I went to, you know, PRI, met with the people over, you know, the social media and it's like, look, you need to come back with more followers because at the time I had like 700 followers or something. And they, uh, they want, you know, a bang for their buck. Right, too. right, right. You know, they right. want exposure. It works by so the second year I went back from 700, I grew my pages to 7,000. And that's still not a lot, you know, yeah. but what I did is I didn't just rely upon those people to talk to. I made friends and I used LinkedIn as a tool yeah. to follow and try to make friends with anybody sure. in the company that I could that I wanted to partner yeah. with yeah. and was fortunately cool. able to do so. Yeah. Made a really strong connection and, and friendship with one of their engineers that went to bat for me the third year I applied and helped push it through because they felt from the corporate side that I would be a good match for Miller. And it's been an amazing, rewarding, uh, yeah. relate, mutually beneficial relationship ever since. Right. Nice. So I, I, I noticed online when I was uh, kind of uh, reading about you before we uh, started talking, you, you've done some work with like mentoring kids. Oh yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean that kind of, not full circle, but you're working your way there. Yeah. So. I feel like mentorship is a pass through of important information, right? Yeah. So when we go, I, I have the, op so, okay. One of my other mentors, Von Hot Rod, is a famous pinstriper in the automotive industry. Right. Um, I would always go to wherever he was at the show 
I'm not asking for his autograph. I would pay him to pinstripe some stuff. But while he's doing it, I was asking him questions like, well, how do you get to where you're at? You know, yeah. uh, what do you do this? How do you do that? You know, and he's like, it was really odd at first because I didn't know who you were. But you were asking the important questions. You right. know, you weren't like saying, oh, do you know this guy? Do you know that? Right, guy? I don't care who right. you know. You have something that I want in life. Yeah. How do I get there? You right. Know? So over a period of time, I built trust with him enough to where he would start sharing information that would be beneficial for me as a person and as a company. And he's the person that gets the credit for me working with kids. So oh, okay. every year I'd see him at the World of Wheels Auto Show and he's like, man, <coughs> excuse me, you really have a great story, you know, since you went to prison and that you've turned your life around and you have this amazing ability to connect with the younger people because you're younger and you have the amazing skill sets that you have, you should really work with kids next year at World of Wheels. Yeah. I'm like, like set up a booth? He's like, yeah, you do Garage Bound and Miller, you know, he's yeah. going all excited. And so I did it, yeah. you know, not yeah. knowing how it was gonna turn out. And they have, a, they have like a kids day, yeah. or, they, they, or right. career day, I think okay. is yeah. what they call it. Yeah. They invite them in the day before the show opens in the morning, and you get the opportunity to sit there and talk to them. And so that was pretty powerful and rewarding because my past alcohol and drug addiction issues started when I was in middle school. Yeah. So I know wow. they're, they're struggling and facing the same exact right. things I am because I'm not unique, right? So it's like, look, here was my experience, you know, and I'm talking to the ones that are on the fence because right now I know in this room people are using alcohol and drugs. Oh, you know, they're yeah, looking yeah. around because they know I know I'm not yeah. dumb. Right, I said, right. you guys are the ones I want to talk to. This, this is the message for you, you know? I had a lot of fun and I did all this craziness, but it got to where it wasn't fun anymore and then I had this ama uh, massive consequence of federal prison, yeah. you know? So, you know, this was what it was like before and this is what it's like now for me and I, welding and fabrication kind of helped me keep my life glued together. Yeah. And then I invite them out to try and I went through great links to set up with this car show to be able to do live arc welding Oh, yeah. uh, Miller supports me through their virtual reality welding systems. So the little kids get to do that. And if they're big enough to have a helmet to fit on their head, we'll put them in the booth and we'll put them on, we'll okay. put them on live arc welding. So it's yeah. been very rewarding. Yeah. So how, how are they, when you're giving or delivering that message and sharing it really, how, how do you like, how do you see when you're, you're hitting home with them? Can you see it like in their eyes? Oh yeah. By like the questions yeah. they ask me. Well, and I really feel afterwards because they'll come out and they'll talk to me and pull yeah. me off to the side and tell me whatever, you know, crazy problems they're dealing with at that time. Yeah. And I, oh, I was like, y'all, so everybody's distracted by their phone. So when I first get in there, I'm throwing t-shirts and stickers <laughs> and I'm like, y'all pull your phones out, the right? Give next me a follow thing you on Instagram, a cannon. you know? <laughs> and then, and then I'm like, okay, I respectfully <laughs> ask you to put your phone away now. And then I start into, you know, what I do, you know, how exciting it is. Like I get to bring my dogs to work every day as being <laughs> self-employed, the fear of what it was to stop my, my day job of having all, you know, knowing I'm going to get this much money if I show up every week to live my life to where the fear of the known was that held me back from starting my own business. Right. You right. know, and just walk through that, tell them about what my <laughs> life was like before, you know, I turned my life around and really what my life is like now. And I talk, I really hit hard about mentors. You know, you need to have multiple mentors in your life. You know, if you know a couple that you look up to that have a, a successful, healthy relationship that you want to emulate, surround yourself with those people and ask them questions about how do I have that for me? Yeah. You know, and yeah. when you're talking and a mentor is talking to you, you listen. If he's telling you something right now that you already know, you don't interrupt him and tell him you already know that because you're going to shut that door. Right. You just be humble. You hear it because what he's going to tell you right after that is going to knock your socks off and save you a tremendous amount of time and uh, getting you forward in life. You think that yeah. philosophy yeah. makes you a good fabricator listening, in this case, customers? Uh, yeah. So again, my customers will tell me what they need yeah. and I listen and I sketch it out and I, re I, I tell them back what they just told me. So there's no misunderstandings, and yeah. then that's my goal. Their problem is my goal. That's awesome. <laughs> Fixing it, you know, anyway. Yeah, I'm going to ask you this. Uh, you work with kids. <laughs> What's your take on those damn kids? <laughs> wow, so um, they don't, uh, some they, of them not have. Not necessarily negative. I just, no. you know, the older you get, I find myself sounding just like every old person I used to right. hate. Right. Yeah. So and like. Get off the grass. Yeah, that, that, I, yeah I have to catch so, myself. I try to show more than tell right 
Yes. It's like, I live a lifestyle that's healthy and constructive yeah. and positive. I have <laughs> a gamut of amazing toys, right? Yeah. So I try to lead by example. You walk into my shop and it looks like a playground. Right. It's like, right. I get to come here every day, yo. I'm like not one of the dudes that wakes up mad that I have to go to work. Yeah. You know, so that says something. Right. Um, right. So I, I track that in, in some of these kids and I'm like, you can have anything that you put your mind to. You know, I started over in 2006 with nothing, not even a cell phone. So, and this is what I have now because I had tunnel vision, dedication. I found something I really enjoyed doing. I pursued that. Wasn't making any money at first, yeah. you know, until I started figuring out I can make money doing this. Right, right. right. You know, and so uh, working with kids is rewarding in the aspect that not every kid, including myself, wanted to go to school. Yeah. You know, I went to college. Right. And I did six semesters and got all A's and B's and I hated every minute of it. Wow. It's like, I just want to be in the garage building stuff. Right. You know? Yeah. And so it's like, when I talked with kids, I'm like, if you are scholastic, you enjoy testing, you're good at testing, you're a good student, you do all these different things that school requires you to, college might be a great uh, avenue for you. Right. Yeah. But if you wake up every day and you don't even want to be there, don't waste other people's time and money right. going, you know, go do something like a trade school where you're yeah. actually working yeah. toward a goal. Yeah shorter term goal that you could get out and be immediately productive and successful right. in life like I did, you know? Yeah. You know, I think what you're, in a way you're saying are, <clears throat> as you've talked about, you measure wealth in different ways. It's not just about money. No. I mean, the, uh, the uh, pleasure of walking into your own garage or now your larger yeah. facility to do what you want to do and not have somebody over your shoulder yeah. just makes a huge difference. Well, I mean, it's huge that how many people get to take their dogs to work with them every day. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. I mean, that's one of the biggest benefits. <laughs> but Mike, don't get me wrong. You, uh, when you're a business owner, everything falls back on you, right? You're fully responsible for all of that. Right, um, right. And, but the risk versus reward versus what you get out of it, it's like, look, we take six or seven trips a year. If I can work really hard for three weeks straight and save enough money to cover everything while I'm gone, you know, I can go do what I want. <laughs> I, <coughs> I don't have to ask. I don't have to. Yeah. <coughs> Wait until next year when I get more vacation time, you know? Right, yeah. I choose when I get to have vacation time. Yeah. yeah. So. Speaking of mentorships, uh, Darla did a great interview with uh, Sharon Hall yep, a Shay. couple years ago. Yep. Uh, she started working for your shop. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so Shay came in. She took a crash course welding class in Cleveland, Tennessee, and then she just came and she was easy to hire because she came and worked, like, I couldn't tell you how many days for free. She's like, I'm just hungry for this stuff, right? Well, then I got to fill in bad because I was having her do all kinds of stuff. I'm like, I should start paying you. And so she worked with us for two or three years. Wow. And um, it got to the point where I had invited my cousin to come live with us, helping him get out of a bad situation in another state. And so I had too many helpers, you know, and I needed to free up space for somebody with more skills. So. I, but I waited and I helped her find another place of employment before that relationship, you know, kind of went. Yeah, it, it, it's it a great interview on uh, thefabricator.com that yeah. Darla did. It's, She's still in it. And I, I see yeah. her around town. She still works with a, another friendly competitor oh, of mine. She's like, Michael, I can't tell you, all, even all the hard times you were on me, how that helped me to become better at what I do. Oh, yeah, good, so good. It's, it's, a really, it's a really nice love relationship. I got another question. Where is the, uh, the flame Tour, uh, throne. Uh, yeah. The Flame of Thrones. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the thro Throne of Flames. Throne of Flames. <laughs> yeah. So, well, Whatever you want. Chucky it's got a lot of names. Flame Tech built yeah. that. And uh, it's like they try to do something new each year, you know, of course. But there's been so many people asking us to bring it back. We might bring it back next year for Fab Tech yeah. uh, and cool. do a round two with it. But you just have in your shop? Oh, so you want to hear the story about that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Lucky Chucky and so I met Lucky Chucky because I had a crazy application <laughs> where I had to cut half inch plate off a concrete floor without damaging the concrete. And they had anchor studs through the floor holding this plate down. And I was trying a plasma cutter. I was trying a handheld torch. And he actually came and spent two days with us and gave me a track torch system to use and this curved uh, end uh, like, like tip on a cutting torch where it just skimmed it off the floor and it worked perfect. So then he approached me a few months later and said, hey, we have, you know, we have a bunch of torches that we were thinking about maybe building something cool for Fabtech. Would you be interested? I'm like, yeah, what do you think? He's like, well, maybe a throne of some kind people can sit in. I'm like, that's cool. He's like, well, how much would you charge us to do that? And so I didn't <laughs> answer, right? For two days, I thought about this because this guy's already helped me. I don't want to like spank his pocket or his company's pocket, you know? Yeah. So what I came up with was, okay, 
you and me build it together. We'll do it after hours and on the weekends. And in exchange for my time and effort, I keep the chair when you're done with Fabtech because I could not afford all of this equipment to destroy and build yeah, something yeah. cool out of, right? Right. Yeah. So that's the agreement we made. I said, but you can borrow it anytime you want, you know? But I want it in my <laughs> office. <laughs> just come, come show up in your Chevette and just throw it in the back. <laughs> yeah, so we built this amazing torch chair that, uh, the throne that uh, comes all apart for packaging and oh, shipping. Does it? Oh, yeah, oh, that it makes comes, sense. It bolts Ooh. all together like, like Legos, you know, like oh, Legos wow. again. Love and, it. And uh, it's in my office set up and we, we take it, we have a, our whole neighborhood uh, has a really cool Halloween party, so we set it up in the neighborhood. And That's awesome. The kids come up and they're yeah. terrified of it, you know. And the next year they get a little more brazen. Yeah, and, there you go. Yeah. But their whole lives, they're told that they can't play with fire, and here we are sitting in a chair that's on fire. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so you can play with fire, but yeah. carefully, right? Right. Yeah. So that's I awesome. think that that'll be coming back to Fabtech soon. But in the meantime. We've taken it all across the country. We had at Dabs Wellington's school. Yeah. Uh, okay. We took it over there and have it on display to show Dab kids. Dabs Wellington, friend of the podcast. Yeah. 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 Sticker. Uh, yeah. We've had it down yeah. in Texas, you yeah. know, at different high school welding events. So I think it's become a great tool to show the next generation that the only thing that limits you is some equipment, some skills, and your imagination. You can do whatever you put your mind to and build anything that you'd like. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Yeah. did you originally think you'd want to have your own business? No, I had no idea. Yeah. No. So uh, I was enjoying and I had collected up enough equipment and I had enough small clientele. Yeah. And my current job, it was at another forklift place that I had taken. And I kept being told by the general manager, I wasn't doing a good enough job. Like, you're not doing your job. You're not getting new customers. You're not doing this. When in actuality, the person that I had to rely upon was a service manager that did not want to grow the dealership anymore. It's like, I don't get any extra money for this extra work. So right. every chance he had, he would sabotage my deals. And so when I realized that that wasn't gonna be a good long-term fit, I saved money and I bought the last two things I needed, which was an enclosed trailer and a, and a Miller Dynasty. Yeah. And as soon as I had those last two things, I put a three week notice in offering to train whoever, they let me go that day and I was no mobile kidding. welding that night and I never looked back. Wow. So wow. my wife told me, she's like, if you can make at least $400 a week, you can quit your job. I'm like, I can buy and sell shit long enough to make $400 a week. I'm out, right? You can make a mountain of metal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so awesome. That's, nice. That's what started that. Wow. Well, uh, thanks for joining us today, yeah, Michael. No yeah, really appreciate it. Yeah. No Congratulations problem. for all your success. Thank you very yeah. much. Where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, Garagebound LLC is my Instagram. Uh, garagebound.com is my is my website and uh, those two things are primarily what I use the most cool awesome. and uh, be sure and subscribe to the fabricator podcast tell your friends uh, tell the neighborhood kids kids love podcasts yeah. I'm told kids do uh, love podcasts <laughs> <laughs> subscribe rate and review wherever you uh, get your podcast and thanks for joining us bye bye now <laughs>